Hi everyone and welcome to this week's online service at Eltham Presbyterian Church. I'm David and it's great to have you join with us today. I expect that most people watching this service uh, live in Melbourne and so you'll be coming to the end of the first week of the stage 4 lockdown restrictions. There can be lots of emotions in this situation including frustration and despair. At times like these I find it helpful to look forward to what God has planned for us. One day the lockdown restrictions will be over. Uh, but more importantly, one day God has something much better for us to look forward to if we trust him and follow him. In Revelation 21, it says this, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you that you are the God of hope. At this time of uncertainty and disappointment, we are reminded that we live in an imperfect world which is marred by the impact of sin and rebellion. Our present circumstances may not be what we'd hoped for and our immediate future may be uncertain. But we thank you that with you, we can have an ultimate future that is certain. Lord, help us to trust you and rely on you through the good times and the bad times in our life and give us a vision for the glorious future that you have planned for us. As we join to together today in all the different places that you've currently put us, bless our service and help us to look forward to a wonderful time when we can all be together with you. Amen.
Good morning. The reading this morning is from Colossians chapter 4, beginning at verse 2 and reading through to the end of the chapter, uh, which is verse 18. Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. And pray for us too, that God may open a door for our message, so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ, for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly, as I should. Be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Tychicus will tell you all the news about me. He is a dear brother, a faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. I'm sending him to you for the express purpose that you may know about our circumstances and that he may encourage your hearts. He is coming with Onesimus, our faithful and dear brother, who is one of you. They will tell you everything that is happening here. My fellow prisoner, Aristarchus, sends you his greetings, as does Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. You have received instructions about him. If he comes to you, welcome him. Jesus, who is called Justus, also sends greetings. These are the only Jews among my fellow workers for the kingdom of God, and they have proved a comfort to me. Epaphras, who is one of you and a servant of Christ Jesus, sends greetings. He is always wrestling in prayer for you, that you may stand firm in all the will of God, mature and fully assured. I vouch for him that he is working hard for you and for those at Laodicea and Herapolis. Our dear friend Luke the doctor and Demas send greetings. Give my greetings to the brothers at Laodicea and to Nympha and the church in her house. After this letter has been read to you, see that it is also read in the church of the Laodiceans and that you in turn read the letter from Laodicea. Tell Archippus, see to it that you complete the work you have received in the Lord. I, Paul, write this greeting in my own hand. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. Hi guys, today's kids talk is from Colossians chapter 4. Grace? Uh, hello everyone here! Oh, hello! Oh. Hi, hello. is your name Grace? Do I look like a Grace to you? I don't know, I've never met one! Well, no, my name's Rob, but pleased to meet you. Oh, pleased to meet, well, uh, actually, not really. I mean, I would be if you were Grace, but you're not so... Well, I can't really help you there. Uh, What's your name, by the way? Oh, me? I am Mo, and I am on a mission. On a mission? Yes. Hold on, let me just split it. Uh -huh. What sort of a mission, I wonder? I'm going on a grace hunt. I'm going to catch a big... I'm not scared. I am a lit... Uh, I'm a little bit scared. Do oh. we really need to point that this way? Oh, sorry! <laughs> I wasn't going to get you. A grace hunt? Why yes, do you, you know hunt? a grace hunt? I do. My niece is a Grace. Excellent! Take me to her! Well, I can't really do that, unfortunately. You can't? Or you won't! She lives too far away. She lives in Geelong, and so <sighs> I can't take you to her, I'm sorry. But why oh. on a Grace hunt? <laughs> hey, it's okay. <laughs> what, why are you on a Grace hunt? Why am I? Well... Does speech mean talking? Mm, it does, yeah. And is Grace a girl's name? What well, is? But and also, hold on, let me just get it right. Should we obey this book? Well, this is the Bible. It's God's yes. book to us. So yes, we should obey what's in the Bible. Well, that's what I'm trying to do. What do you mean? It says so in there. Colo science. Colo Yes. Is that Colossians? I don't know. Is that Colo science? <laughs> well, we're actually studying it at the moment in church, but where does it say that in Colossians? In Numbers 4-6. Four, 4-6? Six. Four, six. Yes. Well, that's fine. You read it out and see. Uh, speak with grace. Aha! Uh -huh! What did I say? Now you need to find grace too. Let's look. 
Um, it's actually talking about a different type of grace. What? Well, in the Bible, when it's talking about grace, it's normally talking. Well, it's often talking about God's grace, which is how He loves us, even though we don't deserve it. Yeah. Here, it's talking about how we speak to other people, so with love and kindness, whoever they are, not just because they deserve it or just because they're our friends. So it's not talking about a girl. It's not talking about a girl called oh. Grace. But you could speak to a girl called Grace like that as well. Oh. I get. Hey, are you talking? I am oh, talking. Let me help you. What's he gonna do Here now? you go. Hold out your tongue. Stick it up. Ha! And then you. Oh, I'm talking. What? Oh, what are you doing? Salty. <laughs> Why have you got salt? Because uh, it says to. Where? In the passage. In there. Let's have a look at that. Yes. Uh, Colossians four. Speak with grace. Speak with grace. Seasons with salt. Salt. Aha! Uh -huh. I told you. Well, it's a bit different. It's different. Yeah. Do you know salt in the Bible was used for a number of things? Yes. One of them, well, one of them we still use today is making food taste good. Oh, like hot chips with salt. If you ever have them without salt, they just don't taste salty. That's true. Another thing uh, we use salt for is for preserving meat, for, for making it not go off so quickly. Oh, that would be bad. I mean, if it went off, I like meat. It is bad. So it's saying that we should speak to other people in a way that is wholesome, that it brings life and brings truth to people. And the ultimate way that we bring truth to people is telling them and sharing about Jesus and who he is and what I he's done. I get it, I get it. It's about the words you use yeah. and the way you say them. It's not about sprinkling salt on your tongue every time you speak oh. to people. <laughs> and it's not about speaking to a girl called Grace. Did you know that? <laughs> I did know that. Yeah. Uh, it's about speaking to everyone. And the rest of that verse tells yeah. us um, so that we, we know how to answer each person we talk to. So... T talking to people, uh, telling them what the Bible says and, and yeah. how we ought to live. Oh, that's speaking with grace and seasoned with salt, but Which not is. really salt and not really a girl called Grace. Ah, that's right. I get it now. Oh, Rob, thank you for your help today. No worries. Lovely to meet you, Mo. Oh, nice to meet you too. Okay, well, I better... Oh, there we are. All right. Well, I better go now. I'm going to try to speak with grace. But not grace. <laughs> I get it. Okay, yeah, I get it. Okay. Well done. Thanks, guys. Good morning, everyone. Uh, as we come together in prayer, uh, let's hear from Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, Lord, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity. And cleanse me from my sin, for I know my transgressions and my sin are always before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. Let's pray together. Well, Lord God, we thank you that you are the justifier of sinners. Uh, through the sacrifice of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Your grace and your mercy have shown how you redeem us by his work on the cross. And on our own, Lord, we are hopeless and helpless. Uh, but with you, Father, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Uh, we thank you for your guarantee that as far as the east is from the west, so far have you removed our transgression from us. Uh, and so we thank you, our Father, uh, that even in this time of uncertainty, of suffering, of sorrow, uh, that we can know that we are loved. Uh, even though so much has changed in the world around us, you've remained unchanged. You've remained fixed and constant uh, in your nature, in your purpose, and in your love. You have not wavered. And so we know that even in death, even in unemployment, even in fear, even in hard moments in our lives, you love us and you are working all things together for our good, even in these difficult things. 
uh, for the good of those who love you and are called according to your purpose. So as your children, Lord, we ask that you would remember your love for us. Remember that you have promised to work even in these things for our good. Lord, would you give us faith to believe and so live differently, knowing that you walk with us along the way. Lord, we pray for one another today uh, that we might as one body at Eltham give you glory and honour uh, and shine your light uh, as we reach out to others with our hope in Jesus. We thank you for the little things that we're even able to do in faith. Uh, for the phone calls, the SMSs, for the face masks and supplies dropped into neighbours and friends and family. Uh, for all those unseen acts of kindness done among your community uh, that are, of course, seen by you. And we thank you that we can do that in the name of Jesus. We pray that our message and our lives will shine even in lockdown. And we pray for those who don't know you yet, who are perhaps watching even now this YouTube uh, Lord, would you soften their hearts by your love. Help them to understand who you are and what it is you've done in Jesus. And we ask that you would bring people to faith even today. We pray too for the world around us in turmoil. Uh, we think of the people in Beirut, in Lebanon, devastated by the explosion this week. Lord, might the survivors and those grieving there find hope and peace in you as they seek to rebuild and rebuild their lives. Would you have mercy on them? And for our city too, uh, in these stage four restrictions, uh, we see people who are in desperate need of you. Would you help those who are saving lives in hospitals, in nursing homes, Help those in government and leadership to make good and wise decisions. Help those who are suffering or grieving or despairing. Might your mercy come to them, we pray. Lord, we pray for repentance, a turning to your light that shines all the brighter, brighter in darkness. And so, Lord, we thank you for your word that declares our great need but also our great hope. And as Don opens it up for us today, would you speak to each one of us by it? Enable us by your spirit uh, to be transformed uh, and made more like Jesus. And it's in his name we pray all these things. Amen. Good morning and welcome to our Last message in the book of Colossians in our series, Walking with Jesus. If you've joined us for the very first time, um, I encourage you to go back and connect up to our website and look up our YouTube links so you can catch up on some of the others in this series. If you've been with us uh, a number of times, I, I pray that you would really continue on. And uh, next week, Andy's jumping into that curious little book called Philemon. And the message in that letter to um, Philemon, the slave owner, um, really undermines the whole issue of slavery. Some people think the New Testament doesn't say anything about slavery, but it says something significant. And the gospel of grace in general has radical, radical implications for our society. And that little letter to um, Philemon is one example um, it's also relevant for today, this idea that the gospel has radical social implications. Um, some of us have started reading this little prayer diary, 21 days of prayer for Christians who are being persecuted in different parts of the world. And on day one, um, it was about India and, and some of the things that are happening in India. So I did a little extra research on what's going on in India. India is technically a secular state, which means it shouldn't um, promote or um, uh, institute any particular religion. 
Um, but there is a very influential group of Hindus who are working very hard to eradicate Christianity and Islam. And they have vowed to eradicate all Christianity and Islam from uh, India by December 31st, 2021. It seems for a long time in India, multiple faiths exist together. Of course, it's a majority, vastly majority uh, Hindu, but it seems for a long time they comfortably existed together. Um, but what offends the Hindu minority is when groups like Christianity try to convert people who were born Hindus. That is considered culturally offensive to them. And it's also considered fundamentally anti-Indian. One of their catch cries would be something like this. Be what you are born and don't try to change. If you're born a Christian, stay a Christian. If you're born a Muslim, stay a Muslim. If you're born a Hindu, stay a Hindu. And that raises a very interesting question. Can I really be a Christian and just let people be what they were born into culturally? Can I really be a Christian and just let people be what they were born into and not try to change that? If you're thinking the answer might be yes, can I respectfully say that perhaps you haven't really understood Christianity and you haven't really understood what Jesus expects of his followers. Christianity is very personal, but it is not private. Today, I'm going to focus on uh, Thessalonians chapter 4 and just really the verses um, 2 through to 6. That's where our focus is going to be. And the big idea is on walking with Jesus deliberately. And to walk with Jesus deliberately means that we are called to advertise and share our faith. This is central to being a follower of Jesus. And in these few verses, I just want to pick out kind of like three action words for today to talk around them. So the first one is praying, praying, and then walking, and then talking. I think on the kids' action sheet, activity sheet, we just got pray, walk, and talk. So maybe kids, you can add ing to each one of the headings for the sermon if you're following through on the sermon. So praying, walking, and talking. Let's begin by getting into the praying part of this passage. Um, Colossians chapter 4, picking up at verse 2. Watch, uh, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. And pray for us too, that God may open a door for our message, so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ, for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. We're going to spend a bit of time on praying, um, more time on praying than the other two, because um, there, there are a number of uh, angles within this that I want to develop just a little bit this morning. So the first one is, devote yourself to prayer by being watchful by being alert. Um, the, the word that Paul uses here in the Greek is about like staying awake and being attentive, being watchful, being alert. It's, it's a call to action. Um, what it means is that you and I need to know what is going on around us if we're going to pray intelligently about what is going on around us in the world, in our lives, in other people's lives, etc. Um, a few years back, or many years ago, uh, a guy called Richard Pratt wrote a book called Pray With Your Eyes Open. Um, maybe we can take it a bit further. Maybe we can say, pray with your eyes and your ears open. Keep your eyes and your ears open and be ready 
to pray at any time. A follower of Jesus is kind of presented here as a person who is on alert, on guard, on guard duty, and ready to pray whenever the need arises, ready to go to action when the need arises. Come over with me to um, verse, um, verse 7 in chapter 4 of, of Colossians. Verse 7, I'll read verse 7 to 9. Tychius will tell you all the news about me. He is a dear brother, a faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. I am sending him to you for the express purpose that you may know about our circumstances and that he may encourage your hearts. He is coming with Onesimus, who Andy's going to talk about next week. He is coming with Onesimus, our faithful and dear brother, who is one of you. They will tell you everything that is happening here. It was important that the Colossian church had all the news about what was happening. So that meant that they could pray specifically and they could pray intelligently for the needs of Paul's team. It's the same with our 21-day diary for praying um, for persecuted Christians, which you can, or if you've got the newsletter, you can follow the link to the PDF version of it. Um, but it provides us with stories about what's happening around the world so that we can pray intelligently for those who are being persecuted for their faith. And one of the things we do learn constantly as we read through this diary is what they want the most is strength and courage and Bibles to read so they can have God's word with them. Okay, that's the first point on prayer. The second one is this. Devote yourselves to prayer by being thankful. Devote yourselves to prayer being watchful and thankful. We live in discouraging times and uncertain times. And you and I can get really overwhelmed by the negatives, and I know a lot of people are being overwhelmed by the negatives. So it's a really good time for us to remember the importance of being thankful about the things that we do have. You know, the old saying is, count your many blessings, name them one by one. And I wonder how many of us just need to stop and pause and take a little bit of time out to actually think about what we have rather than all the things that are going on around us that are inconvenient. Uh, maybe that's something you need to do sometime this afternoon, just to pause, get by yourself, and reflect on what you have, the positives in your life. Be thankful. But being thankful, as it's mentioned here, goes much deeper than that for a follower of Jesus. It's not just about counting your material blessings. Um, let us jump over to verse 12. Epaphras, who is one of you, probably the person who started the church in, Colossian, in Colossae, um, Epaphras, who is one of you, and a servant of Christ Jesus, sends greetings. He is always wrestling in prayer for you. That you may stand firm in the will of God, mature and fully assured. In our um, Bible study groups um, during the week, a number of people were really impressed with the the dedication and uh, love that Epaphras had for the people of this church. And it's really important to know and, or highlight what he was actually praying for. He was praying, most of all, that they would be um, mature and fully assured, meaning fully assured in their faith. The Apostle Paul, in the letter earlier, said it this way. It's just a little bit different, but it's saying the same thing. Come over with me to chapter 2, and um, chapter 2, verse 6. So then, just as you receive Christ as Lord, continue to live in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing 
with thankfulness. So, so what it's saying is that when, when you grow in Jesus, when you're rooted and grounded in Jesus, and the more you know about Jesus, the more you will overflow with a sense of thankfulness. It's the gospel message that creates this aura of thankfulness in our hearts. The more we understand it, the more thankful we will be regardless of our circumstances. The habit of prayer, whether you're just walking down the street or um, riding on the train or um, in a place at home quietly by yourself, the habit of prayer is the secret to being thankful rather than fearful. And when you're thankful, it leads you to another blessing that is really special. And uh, I want you to just flip a few pages back if you've got your Bible. Flip a few pages back to the book of Philippians and let me read to you what it says in Philippians chapter 4 and I'll just pick it up at verse 6. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Isn't that a good place to be? A really good place to be, resting in the peace of God that transcends all understanding. It's that peace that you can have that is bigger than any discouraging circumstances you might be in. It's the kind of peace that will protect your heart and protect your mind. Um, the whole COVID issue is causing a crisis in mental health and increasingly people are stressed out and depressed, whether it's because they're isolated and lonely or afraid. And it's this, this is a really good time for us to have more of the peace of God in our hearts. So it's a good time to pray, learn to be thankful. And when we hear thankful and we pray thankfully, we'll have the peace from God that transcends all understanding if we pray our prayers in Jesus and are resting in Jesus. Earlier, I said that we'd spend more time on praying than walking and talking. And I have one more thing to say about praying, and it's really important. Um, the first is devote yourselves to prayer by being watchful. Secondly, by being thankful. And thirdly, devote yourselves to prayer by being gospel focus. Gospel focus. Remember the question I asked right at the start. Can I really be a Christian and just let people be what they were born into culturally? Well, the blunt answer is this, no. The blunt answer is no. As much as I want the peace of God in my own life, I should have equal passion to see other people have that peace in their lives as well. And this can only happen if they know that Jesus is the saviour and the king of the world and that by faith, the simple act of faith, they can have everything that Jesus offers, including that peace of the Heavenly Father. Jesus, before he left and ascended back up to heaven, told his disciples to go and make disciples of all nations. In Matthew 28, you might want to look that up, but some people call that his marching orders, the final marching orders he gave to his followers before he sent, ascended into heaven. And his final orders basically are this, share the message, share the message. So we shouldn't be surprised with what Paul says in verse uh, 3 and 4 in Colossians. He says, pray for us too, that God may, may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Pray that I might proclaim it clearly as I should. Pray, open doors. 
um, pray that I can have an open door to talk about Jesus. It talks about the, the mystery of Christ. That's the way it's put here in the NIV. Um, early on in chapter 1, Paul talks about the, Jesus being the mystery, the gospel mystery, um, because once upon a time, in, the, in, in times previous, in the Old Testament times, um, it was a mystery about how God would actually redeem people from planet Earth and save them from their sin. Um, there were hints, but it was mysterious, and it wasn't explained until Jesus came. It also says somewhere in the scriptures that angels would peer into what the prophets were saying because the angels were very curious about what was going to happen as well. So what we have is this really special message. It's a tremendously precious message, a special message. And it's for the whole world, without exception. We are to make disciples of all nations. We are to share the message with everyone. So you and I personally, what this means for you and I personally, is that we should pray that God would open doors for us, that God would open a door for me, that God would open a door for you to have the chance to talk about Jesus. If you're not yet a Christian, can I say to you, don't be surprised if we want to talk to you about Jesus. Because... We know that we've got something special and we want to share with you why we think it's special. The story of Jesus dying and rising and ascending into heaven, the story of Jesus where we can have eternal life and peace with God and um, life and life abundant now. What we want is for you to have this blessing. So please, don't be surprised if we want to share this with you. It is because we care, because we want you to have something special. The Apostle Paul said, um, pray that there might be an open door and um, pray that I might be able to um, proclaim it clearly. How you and I talk about Jesus is really important. It has to be clear and uncomplicated it has to be in a language, in a way which relates to other people and they can connect to it. It meets them where they're at. So what that means for you and me as followers of Jesus, we need to know the basics of why Jesus had to come from heaven to earth to die for us and represent us on the cross. We need to know the basics. And we need to know the basics well enough so that we can be flexible with it as we share it in an appropriate way as you and I grow in our faith, we become better at doing this, but the learning never stops. So the Apostle Paul, probably the most famous missionary evangelist in the history of Christianity, he's saying, pray for me that I, I do this better. Pray for me that I do this well. So you and I need to pray for each other. You need to pray for me that I can speak about Jesus clearly. I need to pray for you that you can speak about Jesus clearly and in insensible, meaningful ways. And in this way, we act as a team. One of the things we notice as we're doing our Bible studies this week is all these people in Paul's team. He's locked up in prison, but the work goes on because there's a team. The work of following Jesus deliberately is teamwork. Christianity is very personal, but it was never meant to be private. It is something that is meant to be shared. Okay, we spent a lot of time on prayer, but um, this is kind of like the foundation for what follows. What comes ne next cannot happen without a prayerful heart. So deliberate followers of Jesus, secondly, need to be careful how they walk. So our second action word is walking. You know, walking, the longer version would be walking openly as followers of Jesus. Verse 5. Be wise in the way that you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. So English translations put it you know, in different ways, just so it flows smoothly. 
but a more literal translation could be walking about wisely in front of those outside of the church. Walking about, uh, going around the whatever we do, walking about wisely in front of those outside the church. A little while ago I did a children's talk and I introduced the children to Monty Python's Silly Walks. Silly Walks are funny, but totally ridiculous. And um, they're actually harmful. Hard on your knees in particular. Unfortunately, there are lots of examples of Christians walking in such ways that they look silly. Not only to people outside the church, but also to those inside the church. We are not immune from being silly. Sometimes our silly walks are deeply harmful. And sometimes it involves large parts of the church. The history of the church has some very embarrassing moments and some very dark moments. Um, a couple of years ago, some of us watched a documentary called For the Love of God. And the subtitle to this documentary is this. How the church is better and worse than you ever imagined. How the church is better and worse than you ever imagined. Sometimes it's brilliant, sometimes it's dark. And in that documentary, they had this great illustration of playing in tune <coughs> or playing out of tune. So when the church is playing out of tune with Jesus, it can be a terrible place and do terrible things. Sometimes it's just irrelevant, but sometimes it's terrible when it's out of tune. It's an ugly organisation. But when the church or parts of the church are in tune with Jesus, when they're in tune with Jesus, it can do amazing things. And it can make the world a so much better place. So, you and I are being encouraged to walk in tune with Jesus to live positive lives for Jesus in a way that's a positive example to those who are not yet Christians. Let me read verse 5 again. Be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Be a positive example at every opportunity you have and remember that every opportunity is also about looking to explain what makes you tick as a Christian and why you live the way that you do. I have a couple other um, uh, Bible verses for you as well. The first one is a, is a word from Jesus. Read this. Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Or again, this time from 1 Peter chapter 3. In your hearts set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that you have. Walking with Jesus deliberately is never a private thing. It's never meant to be a private thing. It is meant to be very public for other people to see. And that means on a personal level that you and I uh, are to, to pray for open doors and we pray for opportunities. It's the same kind of thing and pray for the opportunities to talk about why it's important to believe in Jesus 
and why believing in Jesus is the key to a rich and full life and why believing in Jesus is the key to discovering the true purpose of life here on planet Earth. All good things. Let's pray that we have opportunities to easily and comfortably and naturally talk about that because it's so important. This leads uh, really nicely into our third action, and that is walking, uh, talking. Walking and now talking. Verse 6, talking. Let your conversation always be full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Many of us grew up on Vegemite. I actually have shifted from Vegemite over to Primite. It might be un-Australian, but that's what I've done. Um, but it's really funny to watch Americans sampling or trying to sample Vegemite or take up a Vegemite challenge of some sort. One of the best comments from an American that I heard about Vegemite was from an American comedian who was visiting Melbourne when I heard him on the radio. And he said, you know, um, I've just got one suggestion. How about a little more salt? Of course, he's being humorous because Vegemite's full of salt. Now, in recent decades, salt has kind of got a bad name because salt's in everything that we have and uh, it's overdone and we're getting too much of it. But in ancient times, salt was incredibly valuable. I remember watching a documentary a number of years ago, so I can't remember all the details. But people used to, in, this is in Africa, people used to travel up a river and then walk out into the des desert and buy salt from a tribe that lived out in the desert. And they took gold with them to buy salt because the salt was so important and so valuable. Salt not only gives flavour to food, takes a bland food and makes it more flavorful. It draws out flavors in some foods. But it also preserves food. And when you don't have refrigerators and freezers, salt was incredibly valuable and important. So that's the context to what it's saying here, that our conversations be full of grace, seasoned with salt. It means that our conversations ought to be rich, meaningful, and, and, and valuable to the people that we are talking to. Um, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29, puts it this way. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. It is such a blessing to other people if we can have real conversations with them, real conversations about real life. And the deeper we develop relationships, the more likely we are going to go into those real life conversations beyond the weather and stuff like that. Talking about the weather might be a good place to start, but what people really appreciate are deep conversations about real life. That's getting personal. And the other thing that's really important about having good conversations is that you're a safe person to have a conversation with. Be a safe person, as well as um, your language being temperate, that what you say is meaningful and not frivolous, and that you actually want to know what's going on in a person's life. In the end, the greatest seasoning that we can put with our conversations is the seasoning of grace. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt so that you may know how to answer everyone. Once again, I need to say that Christianity is personal, very personal, but it's never meant to be private. And what we have here is really, it circles back. 
to what we were talking about earlier, circles back to praying for open doors, for opportunities, to talk about what is most important, the grace of the Lord Jesus, and being ready when people ask us what makes us tick and why do we believe the things that we do and why do we have confidence when all things might seem to point otherwise. It is because we know the Lord Jesus. So walking deliberately means always looking for the chance to say something about Jesus in the most natural way you can. And if your outward life, the way that you've been walking, if your outward life and your normal conversations are in tune with Jesus, well then it's going to be natural to have these conversations about Jesus. Your life will match what you're saying. It will make sense to your friends that what you're talking about when you're talking about Jesus actually means something to you and changes your own life and is of value to you. Anyhow, how can we wrap up today's message? Well, let me wrap up this way. Um, just yesterday, I read an article which referred to something that the World Health Organization was saying, and the World Health Organization was pleading with the rich nations not to use their extraordinary wealth to hog all the vaccines that might come forth for COVID. Because they can. How self-centered and cruel would that be? if one country came up with a vaccine and they kept it all for themselves and refused to share it? Or how cruel and selfish would it be if one country that has scads of money can buy out the entire supplies of a vaccine so nobody else gets it? It's called um, vaccine nationalism. So the WHO, the World Health health organization was speaking against vaccine nationalism and it was saying vaccine nationalism that is keeping the vaccine just for themselves and the rich doing it just for themselves would actually harm the rich countries as well not only harm the poor countries but it would harm the rich countries it said this um, for the world to recover faster it has to recover together because it is a globalised world. The economies are intertwined. We cannot recover unless we help everyone recover from COVID. How selfish would it be for you and me to keep the story of Jesus to ourselves and not share it? How selfish would it be to keep the message of how you can have peace with God and eternal life? It's a precious message. Why should we keep it to ourselves? We would be robbing others. How selfish would it be to keep the message that by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ you can discover the true meaning of human existence? Everyone needs to hear that. Let's not keep it to ourselves. Let's not have this sort of faith nationalism that robs other people of something that's really important. Walking deliberately with Jesus means that while my faith is very personal, it never ever should remain private. It's not a private thing, it's a public thing and we want it to be public. So, our action words for today, praying, walking, talking. How about I just pray now for all of us? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this letter that was written to the church um, such a long, long time ago. But it is your word as well to us, inspired by the Holy Spirit, even though Paul was the penman. And Lord, we thank you for the reminder that the precious knowledge we have of the Lord Jesus it's wonderfully personal and it touches our hearts, but it's never meant to be kept just for ourselves. It's meant to be a public thing, that other people can see it in our lives and that we have this a desire to talk about it and share this wonderful news. 
And Heavenly Father, we pray that um, as we talk about it, that people would see consistency in our lives and that people would also see that we're talking about what we believe because we are doing them a favour and we care for them and we want them to know the things that we know. We pray these things in the Saviour's name. Amen. Thank you for being with us this morning. And I trust that it's been a blessing at many different levels. And I'd really like to encourage you to come back and join with us again next Sunday as uh, Andy opens up to us that little curious little book of Philemon. But as we close our time together, let me read to you some parting words from 2 Thessalonians. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope, encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and word. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen.